this girl says, you get in there and take your clothes off. I said, nice lady. She starts throwing stuff in. I say, I like this. I'll buy this. So it was a, it was a nice, it was a nice game. I got clothes here. So, thank you. Okay, we ready to rock and roll, folks? Made the room? Yeah, it sure does. Neat, huh? It's going to look great on the videotape. Liberty Bell, I mean, you know, do your part. Is, is, it, is it more than just symbolic that it's cracked? <laughs> no. Actually, it was run like it broke. Uh, it was a church bell. Now it's part of a shrine. I guess it tore the church down but kept the bell or something. It's cracked. Yeah. Okay. How's everybody doing? Good? Oh, yeah. All right? All right. I'm sorry that Mark isn't here because I have the ultimate male chauvinist pig joke. Now, I would never tell this joke, but I had a friend that told me this story. He said, Michael, be sure and tell the following story. It seems that this man uh, came home one evening after working very diligently at his white-collar job and found his wife sitting in the living room wearing dungarees and a uh, sweater, reading our bodies ourselves. And he said, where's my dinner, honey? She said, I've been to a feminist meeting. I don't have to cook your meal. He goes, oh? She says, you cook it yourself. So he says, oh? So he cooks it himself. He was pretty good at pushing the right button on the microwave and letting the dinner come off. So he had his dinner, and he says to her, uh, how about the dishes? She said, I've been to the feminist meeting, honey. I don't have to do the dishes. And he goes, oh? He does the dishes. A little later, he said, why don't you come sit next to me and we'll cuddle? And she said, I've been to the feminist meeting. I don't want to just be loved for my body. I don't have to be cuddled. And he goes, oh, and he's there steaming and steaming and steaming. He says, honey, why don't you come to bed? Like to uh, get friendly. And she said, I have been to a feminist meeting, and I want to tell you something. I've learned I don't have to let you use and degrade my body anymore. I'm not coming. And at this point, he is fuming. He comes out of the living room and he says, honey, how would you like it if you didn't see me for three days? She said, fine. First day, she didn't see him. Second day, same thing, she didn't see him. Third day, the swelling went down and she started to see him. <laughs> oh. Oh. <laughs> that is the ultimate male show in this joke. How many people think that is a male show in this pig joke? Is that awful? Now, i got to tell you who I got to tell you, the guy that told that to me was a member of the Latter-day Saints. Those are Mormons. And uh, I, said, I said to him, gee, uh, I can see that your church is coming a long way with women's issues, isn't it? <laughs> and he said, well, my wife thought it was funny. I said, did you cook your dinner? <laughs> and he said, yeah, and she saw me too. And I said, oh, well, I'd never tell a joke like that. But I thought for informational purposes, you should know the joke that was told to me so that you would never stoop so low just to do that. There's a story, there was a, does anybody know who the Sufis are? Sufis? S-U-F-I-S? -S? Okay. Sufis are a group of religious people. They're an irreligious religion. Matter of fact, the name Sufi didn't even become popular until like the 1700s. Sufis were the kind of people that didn't buy the idea that you go to church to, to get to God. They didn't buy the idea that you sat in pews and somebody rammed it down your throat and you had to believe what they said. And so they would, they sought enlightenment or spiritual uh, opening or awareness by means of spiritual exercises, which you may see in people such as Gurdjieff, P.D. Ospinsky, R.A. Orage, if you've read any of those people. In the Sufi tradition, the Sufis were hated and reviled by all the other religions because they asked the kind of rude questions that offend and embarrass religious dogmatists. There's a famous character in Sufi religion whose name is Mullah Nasruddin. 
you ever hear stories about the mule in Asrutin, he was the ultimate in troublemakers. He was the ultimate smart ass. He was the Lenny Bruce of religion. It seems that one day the mule in Nasrudin angered the Shah or the Emperor. And the Emperor finally had it up to here with his religious irreverence. And you know what irreverence is, don't you? Irreverence is asking questions when you ought to be reverent. And he had it up to here and he says, I'm sentencing you to death. Threw him into the prison. The, drag, the, the guards dragged him in there. Well, the next day the guards dragged him out in front of the Emperor and said, and the Emperor said to him, do you have anything to say before I have you executed? And he says, sire, I certainly do. He said, if you will give me a year, if you'll give me a year, I'll teach your steed to fly. You'll be able to ride your horse over the kingdom and look down upon all your subjects. You'll begin to see all the wonders that your kingdom has wrought. You'll be able to go near and far. You'll be able to see all the things in the kingdom. In a year, I'll teach your horse to fly. He says, think about it. I'm your prisoner. I'm not going anywhere. Think about it. How can you lose? The emperor thinks about it and says, all right, you're on. So the guards dragged the mule and Asrudin back to his uh, cell. And his cellmate says, are you nuts? You can't teach a damn horse to fly. And the mule looked at his, uh, at his uh, cellmate and said to him, oh, I don't know about that. A lot of things can happen in a year. He says, uh, the emperor could die. And the next emperor might be much more loving than he is. The emperor could be uh, removed from power. And it's a policy that when a new emperor takes uh, charge, to release all the political prisoners. Working with a horse, I might come to be friends with the emperor's children. And how could you kill your children's friend? Ah, uh, a lot of things can happen in a year. And who knows? If that doesn't work out, maybe I can teach the damn horse to fly. <laughs> None of that has anything to do with what's going on here tonight. So you don't need to remember this story. As a matter of fact, you'll forget it. And it's okay to forget it because you'll forget it for about a week. And then you'll remember it. A year is a lot of time. And with time comes opportunity. And with opportunity comes new choices. And just remember, the horse might learn to fly. Let's talk a little bit about mind focus. Now, we're going to talk in several areas. And I'm going, to, I'm going to play some games with you, and it's okay to play the games. People that don't want to play the games don't have to play the game. By the way, if you want to get a book on Mule and Asrud, and if you want to read uh, uh, Snotty Little Tales, there's, there's a book called The Incomparable Mule and Asrudin, N-A-S-R-U-D-I-N. And these are Sufi teaching tales. And it's edited by a man named Idris, I-D-R-I-E-S, Shaw, I believe, S-H-A-H. And if I'm mistaken on the last name, please forgive me. But Mule and is definitely spelled correctly. That's M-U-L-L-A-N-A-S-R-U-D-I-M. The teachings of the incomparable Mula Nasrudin. And they're so outrageous that they'll make you think. And that's all right. Thinking's a good thing. Matter of fact, it's contagious. It could lead to such things as freedom. We're going to talk about mind focus in a number of different areas, different ways of asking questions in powerful, provocative, productive ways. I always like asking questions that nobody ever thought of before. And one of the most interesting ways I ever find to ask questions that nobody ever thought of before is to ask people, what question have you never been asked before that you really wish someone would have asked you before? I did that with uh, Tommy Smothers, and he spilled his guts and told me everything that I'd never known about him. And I thought it was the damnedest thing because I liked him even more. But that's not a question you ever want to ask anybody. Is tell me what question nobody has ever asked you before that you really wish someone would ask you. So you can tell them. That's not a question you ever want to ask. So I'll repeat it one more time. What's a question that no one has ever asked you before that you really wish they'd ask so you can answer it? And when you ask people that, they come up with weird answers. Some of them are very interesting. Now we're going to talk about mind focused questions in several areas. I'm going to start with an area called diets. Anybody ever been on a diet? No cheating. Come on. I know. I can read your souls. Get real, Mike. Get real? I tried to get, I tried to get real, but it was out of stock. Oh, you've never heard of the uh, Karen Carpenter diet? <laughs> Just an, hey, lighten up. You didn't buy our records. It's your fault. 
Um, we're going to talk about diets, uh, applying mind focus to diets. We're going to talk about negotiating. Uh, a little bit in romance. Is there another area? What, what else did I list with? What, er what other area did I list with talk about mind focus in? It's on the brochure. Has anybody got the brochure? I know there was a fourth area, but it escapes me. It'll occur to me as I go along. Now, one of the most difficult parts about any area is evaluation. Evaluating how important something is. Remember I gave you the example on Sunday about on a scale of 1 to 10, with 10 being the most important thing in the world, where would you place this? I'm going to give you some ways of measuring it. And what I want to do is start with dieting because it's a particularly fun area. Has anybody ever eaten a Thanksgiving meal or a Boxing Day meal, and you have to be rolled onto the couch because you, <laughs> there's no room? Has anybody done that? I've done that. And it's God's way of punishing you for too much turkey or too much ham or whatever it is that you ate too much of. Now, an interesting thing that about uh, overeaters is they don't measure how much they need to eat. They don't have any mechanism that tells them, that's enough, stop, I'll explode. I learned some ways of measuring how not to overeat. And you're going to apply these to other areas. You can do this about drinking too much alcohol. I know no one here drinks too much alcohol because I saw you all Saturday night and I remember you. <laughs> Do you remember me from Saturday night? If you don't, you drank too much, and you can use this method. You didn't drink too much. You were dancing your hips off, honey. You can't fool us. She, she knows how to bop till she drops. One of the neat things about, about uh, naturally thin people, people that don't have to diet, always seem to be able to eat things that you hate them for because you can't. I'm talking about these kind of people. One thing they do is they know when they're hungry. I'm going to ask you a weird question. How do you know when you're hungry? Stop saying I want you to think about it. There's no wrong answer. Just think about it a second. How do I know when I'm hungry? Now, who would like to give me an answer? How do you know when you're hungry? When I see a commercial. When I see... Okay. How do you know when you're hungry? Yes. Your stomach rumbles. Okay. How do you know when you're hungry? Another answer. You get a headache. Get a headache? Okay. Yes. An empty feeling? Where do you feel the empty feeling? What part of your body? Here, here, or where? Here. Right here. Okay, below your chest cavity. Below your chest, right below there? Okay. Other people, how do you know when you're hungry? When it's near your regular eating time. That's interesting. Okay, let me take this answer. And again, all the answers are right, but I want to take this one for a second. Try this at work sometime. Ask somebody, you're hungry, and watch. If they're a man, they'll look at their watch. It's 12, I guess so. <laughs> what? Don't take my word for it. I have, I've tested these out. I've field tested them with the best. Don't take my word for it. Give it a try. Very often, we look for external cues to let us know how we feel. You know, do you like Chinese food? I asked a friend of mine, and he says, I guess so. I eat it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> what? I mean, that's a, isn't that a weird answer? But is, is that any more weird than I look at my watch? In fact, I've done it. Has anybody else here done it? You don't know if you're hungry, so you look at the watch. Or you don't know if you're hungry, so you ask yourself how long it'll take to microwave the meal. Or whether you should go to Mickey D's. That's McDonald's for those who are not cool and would like to be. Now, how do you know when you're hungry? Very often, we don't have a way of measuring it. My stomach rumbles. Yeah. Very often, people, who's ever done this? You go into the kitchen. You're not quite sure what to do with yourself. You're sort of an audience, and you start looking around for something to satisfy you. And you kind of open the fridge, and you look at it, and you wait for something to go, eat me! I'll fill you up! Now, maybe your fridge doesn't talk the way mine does, but maybe it's a little quieter. Have you ever done that? You just sort of open the fridge to see what you're hungry for? OK, let me tell you a few things about naturally thin people that you might find interesting if you want a simple way of never having to diet again. Four things about naturally thin people. Number one is they only eat when they're hungry. They only eat when they're hungry. People who are naturally thin, most of them normally only eat when they're hungry. Two, they eat exactly what they want. Write that word exactly. Exactly what they're hungry for. Exactly what they want. That, by what they want, I don't mean whatever they feel like. I mean what their body wants. If you're hungry for an apple, and you eat a banana, 
It doesn't satisfy in the same way. If you're hungry for a pot pie and you go, I shouldn't eat that, I'm supposed to be on a diet, I'll go eat some celery. What happens when you're done with the celery? Your body goes, I still want food and I'm going to torture you. And then you scarf down a box of peanuts or something else, which also doesn't satisfy you. They only eat when they're hungry. They eat exactly what they want to eat. They eat consciously. Eat consciously. How many people have had the following experience? You go to a movie, you get a box of popcorn, you're watching the previews for the next movie to find out when you get to go again. And the first couple bites of popcorn taste great, and then you realize your hand's at the bottom of the box. How many have had that sensation go, Jesus, I'm done already? What happened to that popcorn? Is there someone near me eating out of my box? What happened was you had the automatic eating machine on. I've got the automatic eating machine. I, matter of fact, I, I, I told Robert about that. Maybe I did. Maybe I told you about it. Was you have, a, have some potato chips sitting in front of you, and you're in front of the TV? Don't put it in front of me, because without thinking, it'll all be gone, and I'll go, where did those go? Well, they went in your mouth. This is where they went. Okay, the third thing they only do is they, they only eat consciously. And fourth, they stop when they've had enough. Now, they, notice I didn't say they count calories. I didn't say they read the Weight Watchers manual. I didn't say they tortured themselves. I said they only eat when they're hungry, they eat exactly what they want, they eat consciously, and they stop when they've had it, when their bodies had enough. There are exceptions. There are exceptions to everything. And exceptions to everything are very good reasons for hit and run driving. <laughs> because those people should not be allowed. Because they envy, I envy them. No, I'm just teasing. There are exceptions to everything. I know some people that burn stuff just looking at it. I know other people that put on weight when they look at a chocolate eclair. Now, suppose you want to apply a focus technique to dieting. Now, I know most people here don't have a problem with dieting. Maybe don't have a weight concern. I do from time to time. I'll go up 10 pounds. And when I go up 10 pounds, I decide I'm going down 10 pounds because I don't want to be overweight. I've been overweight as a kid and will not tolerate it. It's not a good way to live for me. Here are a few things, and I, you're going to notice some of the techniques from yesterday. The first thing you do is you measure your hunger. You give yourself a hunger scale. Now, naturally thin people already have it inside. and They've got it internalized, and it's very automatic. If you're not naturally thin, here's what you do. On a scale of 1 to 10, how hungry am I? 1 is, I'm so hungry, I'm going to die of starvation. I'm too weak to reach for the Oreo cookie and the milk. 10 is, I'm so full from the, hot, from the Thanksgiving or Boxing Day meal, I'm going to explode and food is going to be all over the wall. It's going to look like one of those kind of movies. A 9 is, I'm not quite ready to explode, but I will be if I put in one more bite. An 8 would be, I am really stuffed. A 7 would be, I've had more than I need and I feel uncomfortable. A six is, I shouldn't have had those last four cookies. <clears throat> and a five is, I'm perfectly satisfied. That was just right. If you ever had just right amount, you walk away from the table feel just great, but just enough. Okay. Now, a four might be, I'm a little hungry. I'm a little hungry. I could, you know, I could stand a couple cookies or a banana or an apple. A three, I'm starting to get real hungry. A two is, now, now, and a one, boom, you're going to fall over. Now, using that scale of one to ten, whenever you say I'm hungry, ask yourself, how hungry am I? Write that question down. How hungry am I on a scale of one to ten? Why do you use a scale so you don't lie to yourself? Now you've got an objective or a pretty objective scale that you can look at and go, I'm not one hungry. I know I'm not going to fall over dead. How hungry am I really? Well, I'm just a little hungry. Maybe that's two cookie hungry or one sandwich hungry. Okay? Very obvious, isn't it? It's very simple. If this appears too simple, you're going to see how simple it is as I continue to apply it. Now, how hungry am I? And you give yourself an answer. Then ask yourself, what is my body, not what am I, what is my body hungry for? Now, if you're hungry for something that's uh, sweet, there are a lot of things sweet. An apple sweet, apple cobbler sweet, right? What am I hungry for? What is my body hungry for? 
as soon as you think you got the answer, mentally go through the process of taking a bite of the apple, a bite of the cake, a bite of whatever and go, is that what my body's hungry for? And your body will go, no, your body knows what it's hungry for. Your body's a lot smarter to give it credit for. You just spend so much time with it, you never listen. Okay, what is my body hungry for? And then only eat that. Don't say to yourself, I'm hungry for a piece of cherry cobbler, but I'm gonna have the seven carrots instead. Because when you're done with the seven carrots, A, you're gonna hate the carrots, B, you're going to still be hungry for the cobbler, and C, you're going to snack and scarf and graze and barf. Yuck. Okay, very obvious. Right? Eating consciously means you don't read the newspaper, you don't read the book while you're eating, you don't turn on the TV. You can have an interesting conversation if it's with a friend and if you're paying attention to the food. You know, food tastes really good. Most people don't even know what their food tastes like because they taste the first bite and then the machine's on. Now, this is an interesting way of measuring food, isn't it? Now, suppose you get to the point, you're halfway through your meal, and you go, am I hungry? Put your fork down. Take a moment. Sit there and say, am I hungry? Has my body had enough? And then get it on a scale of 1 to 10. How full am I? Well, I'm about a 5 and a half. Is that enough? Ask your body. Your body will tell you. Very obvious, simple thing, isn't it? Very simple way of focusing your attention on what's really going on. You're feeding your body, not your ego. If you've got an emptiness in the soul, all the food in the world won't handle it. It's like alcohol. Does anybody have any friends who are alcoholics? Okay. Anybody have any friends who are druggies? Okay. If you've got a friend that's an alcoholic, you know, they got a line in, in Alcoholics Anonymous. One drink is not enough. One drink is too much. And all the drinks in the world are not enough. And the point is that they can't even handle one drink. That's cool. If you can't handle one drink, don't drink. All right. The difficulty with that is you've got an automatic behavior and there's not much you can do about it if you take the first one. And that's equally true of scarf foods. Now, you can measure what you want to eat in a lot of ways. Now, I use a scale of 1 to 10. Let me give you some other things. Make a fist with your hand. Make a fist with your hand. Now, look at your fist. That's how big your stomach is when it's empty. That's how, that's how much space there is in an empty stomach. Now look at your plate and the food there. Is it this big? Is it this big? Is it this big? Now, did, how many of you knew your stomach empty was this big? How many knew it? No lying now. Okay, how many didn't know? I didn't know it until it was full of me. Very often, we don't have a frame of reference for knowing how much food to put on your plate. Did your mom and your kids say, if you put it on your plate, yeah, or clean your plate. There are people in. <laughs> yeah. And you didn't have a way of measuring how much food to put on your plate. So two things went in. Number one, you couldn't visualize how big your stomach was. And two, since you put it on the plate, you didn't want to waste it. I don't want to waste it. Has anybody ever done that? I don't want to waste it. All right, let me give you a Michael measurement. It's going to be wasted whether you put it in here or put it in the garbage. Either way, it's wasted because you don't need it. If you eat more than you need, it's wasted. If you put it in the garbage, it's wasted. The only question is whether it's going to be wasted and you're going to be fat, or it's going to be wasted and you're going to be thin. It's all right to waste it and be thin. There may be some garbage man out there that will pick it up later. We don't know. All right? So use that as a way of measuring how much food to put on your plate. Very simple, isn't it? Most of us don't know what we're hungry for. How many times do you just sort of graze? I guess I'll go look in the fridge and see what speaks to me. What turns me on. The pickle wants me. <laughs> that piece of cake is calling my name. Because we don't measure our hunger, because we don't measure what we're hungry for, do we? What do we do if we go to someone's house and they're cooking something we don't like? Do we eat it anyway? I'll eat a little bit anyway out of niceness. But beyond that, I'll go, I've had enough. And I'll drink a little water and I'll go home and eat what I really want. Yes? I think to an extent that opening the fridge and looking and rolling through the cupboards is trying to figure out what you want. Exactly. That can be. That can be. That's a very good point. Sometimes if you can't picture it in your head, just going through the fridge. But in a lot of cases, what we're doing is we're looking for a way of killing anxiety. You know, we're just nervous because we don't know what to do with ourselves. It's an hour before anything's on. Nothing's on TV. And I don't know what to do tonight. And 
I've got an idea. I'll be fat. <laughs> oh, boy, that'll fill up my time. No, it won't. It'll fill up your pants, but it won't fill up your time. Now, you've got to remember that people eat for a lot of reasons, just like they talk for a lot of reasons, right? They eat because they're nervous. They eat because they're hungry. They eat because it's the social thing to do. They eat because they don't know what else to do. They eat because TV is so boring that if they divide some of their attention to eating, they don't realize how boring it is. And I know none, none of you have ever engaged in boring behavior and done something else to divert your attention. I was given a story uh, in Cheers. Anybody ever watch Cheers? All right, you know who Norm Peterson is? One night he's sitting at the bar and describing, uh, uh, I think Coach is looking at him, and no, it's not Coach, it's Kirstie Allen. It's later on in the show. Kirstie Allen is looking at him and saying, uh, what are you doing? He says, well, we're writing down names for kids. Oh, for kids. Yeah, me and Vera are trying to have a kid. Really? What names you got? And they start talking about the names. So, well, when did you start doing this? He says, well, we try and think up names during sex. It helps pass the time. <laughs> and that seemed like an extreme example of the other. Now, what we're doing, and what I'm doing here, I'm just using this as a metaphor. See, you've got to remember, eating is, a lot, is, in a lot of cases, the same thing as how we deal with people. Have you ever called somebody on the phone because you didn't know what else to do with your time? Have you ever done that? Or because you needed someone to talk to and you didn't even care who it was, you know. So I'll dial an unknown number and whoever answers is mine. Yeah, midnight caller. Now, very often we eat in the same kind of way. We don't measure how hungry we are. We don't measure what we want because we don't know how to measure it. See, what's going on in here is confusing. It's confusing what's going on in here. We're not quite sure what we want in our romantic lives, in our personal lives, in our business, and in our food. So what do we do? We take whatever's around, and we usually take it to an extreme. And incidentally, if you want to, uh, if you want to play some games with, with uh, non-dieting, and you want to have a lot more fun eating, there's a real great book on that called Diets Don't Work by Jack Schwartz. It's a real neat workbook, too. Diets Don't Work by Jack Schwartz. Now, you think, well, everybody knows how to judge their hunger. Everybody knows how to make decisions about their body. Everybody knows when they've had enough food. Well, if that's true, then why do people overeat? Why do they get so stuffed that they have to roll away? Why do people overdrink if they know when they've had enough? The answer is they don't know when they've had enough, do they? And very often, we're in the same boat now. All I've done is given you a couple ways of measuring it. Now, I've given you a scale of 1 to 10. I've given you a, a fifth. Very obvious, isn't it? Very simple. But those are different ways of measuring or quantifying something that feels very subjective. But you can quantify anything. Have you ever heard the phrase, can you measure love? All right? And the idiots of the world go, you can't measure love. And love is too important to be measured. Everything that's very important needs to be measured even more. You can measure love, you can measure anger, you can measure interest. For example, suppose you wanted to measure love. You could do 1 to 10 scale, but there are a lot of ways of measuring it. For example, if you really love to do something, how do you know you love to do something? What evidences do you have when you really love doing something? Answers, yes. You want to do it again. What? You want to do it again. You want to do it again. Okay, that's one. Satisfaction after you do it yeah. or while you're doing it? Um, well, I don't want to actually have experiences that you get Okay. How else do you know when you enjoy or love doing something? Makes yeah. you feel good. Makes you feel good. How else do you know? Time passes very quickly. Time passes very quickly, yes. You like to do it a lot. You like to do it a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Beg your pardon? When you miss it after a while. When you miss it after you haven't done it for a while. Like, you know you're hungry for food, when you, you, you know it's time for more food when you're hungry again, right? And you know it's more time for love when you're amorous again. See, I'm trying to keep it clean. I'm keeping out of the gutter. I mean, we've got one person in this town who will swim in the gutter for the rest of us. I won't even name him, even though he isn't here. I know it's a bookstore. However, oh, I, I pick on Mark in person, so I don't have to pick on him while he's gone, but I view it as my duty. Anyway. You can, in fact, measure love, and there are a lot of other ways to measure it. Now, these are a few ways of measuring, but let me give you some other ways. One very good way to measure how much you love doing something or how, how much you love something 
When you love something, don't you like to take time with it? If you really enjoy an activity, don't you like to spend time with it? I had somebody who says, I really love my wife. And I go, well, you only spend like 20 minutes a day with her. It's quality time. Yeah, right. If you really love your job, it's you spend time with it. If you really enjoy it, you, you don't just spend time with it. You spend quality time. You pay attention to it. I really love my spouse. Do you listen to your spouse? Do you enjoy spending time with your spouse, or do you spend every opportunity getting away from your spouse? Simple. I love my job. Do you, you want to tell how you love your job? Do you look forward to going in? You want to tell if you love your spouse? Do you look forward to going home? Or do you say, well, I think I'll stop by the bar for you know, like five or six hours? <laughs> like Norm Peterson. Okay? How could you measure love? There are a few ways. You can measure it in terms of quantity. If I knew I was going to spend the next 50 years of my life with this woman, this man, would I look forward to it? And if your answer is, hula, 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 that's a no answer. If, yeah, I'd like that. I'd like to grow old with this person. Provided they don't get too wrinkly. <laughs> oh, I'm teasing, I'm teasing, I'm teasing. You'll probably get wrinkly too and you won't notice it. You know, that actually, that's, that's the way God works it out. This is what, how age works. Do you know how age works? Age works is that as you get older, you start getting wrinkly. All right? Now, this is not very attractive. So God compensates by diminishing your eyesight. Your eyes start going a little bit so you can't see the wrinkles. Well, that doesn't eliminate other people seeing your wrinkles, so God reduces your hearing a little bit. You have trouble hearing. Well, sooner or later, someone gets close enough to say it to you, so God brings in memory lapses, right? So you forget that they said they saw you were wrinkly. This is God's way of compensating for aging. I, uh, this is just a theory at this point. If it makes sense to you, boy, are you in trouble. <laughs> If it makes any sense at all. Now, how else could you measure love? You can quantify love in several ways. Do I enjoy spending time with my spouse? Or you can do this with your job. Do I enjoy spending time at my job? Do I think about my job when I'm not there? That's a way of telling whether you enjoy your job. I like my job. When, I, when I'm away from writing, I think about writing. When I'm away from doing stand-up comedy, I think about it. I think about it, I go, you know, I got a really great idea. The next thing I know is I'm sitting at my, at my uh, eight and a half by 14 legal sheet coming up with some ridiculously vicious thing to say about someone who doesn't have a chance to defend themselves. That's the best kind of comedy to do. People who are further than arm's length away and not armed. That's the way to do stand-up comedy. Now, do I spend time thinking about it? Do I enjoy the time I spend? Well, how do you know if you're enjoying the time? Do you spend the time together doing something else or doing it with each other? I know people that say, we spend lots of time together. Well, what do you do? We watch TV. Boy, there's an interactive skill. <laughs> My Wiley Coyote doll, which is so high, you know, the, the, the guy that always gets trounced by the Roadrunner? I think he's got a bad rap, and so I got one spot this tall. And I can sit next to him and watch TV. And I don't love him. But if I did the same thing with my wife, I wouldn't call that quality time. I wouldn't call that love. How else do you tell if you love somebody? You, you can tell you like somebody exactly by what you talked about, or you like an activity by how long away from it. How soon after you've been away from it, you want to be back to it. If you're away from your job in three hours and you go, God, I really want to go back and do it. If you're away from your spouse during the day and you get lonely, or you get thinking about them, and you call them. Not to check and see whether the mailman is making an extra deposit. We're talking about to find out whether or not something interesting is going on. Do you enjoy that? That's measurable. How frequently do I call them? How much do I miss them? Do I enjoy being with them? Some interesting ways. Let me give you a sneaky way of measuring how much you like your spouse. This is a way that I would never dream of recommending to anybody. But since we're dealing with mind focus, I can tell you that a friend of mine might recommend it to you. Take your spouse to a party. Take your spouse to a party and brag about him or her to other people and see if you feel comfortable doing it. That blows their mind. First of all, I, I know people that used to go to parties just because that's the only time they bragged about each other. They liked to hear what their partner liked. Oh, you like that about me? Ooh, that's neat. 
Now, very simple ways of measuring your valuing of the person. So you got to remember, when you value something, you pursue it and you want to keep it, don't you? If you value money, you spend a lot of time pursuing money and keeping money and being a little bit of a minus or a miser, right? If you value leisure time, what do you do? You spend time pursuing leisure time or making a space for it or spending time in it. Those are measurable things. You can do it by number of hours spent, how much you enjoyed the time you spent. You know how much you enjoyed the time. Has anybody ever watched a three-hour movie that was so engrossing that you lost track of the time? You ever read a long, 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 long book and lost track of the time? Atlas Shrugged. I actually, I figured out the perfect solution of beating the mystics with Atlas Shrugged. So I recommend just sort of throw the book at them. That would give them all hernias and they would be beyond redemption. Of course, they'd probably have Shirley MacLaine put hands on them and heal and they deserve what they get. Or Jane Fonda do a work, spiritual workout with them in the next dimension. I don't know. Now, it's very important when you're measuring stuff is to compare it. To measure something is to compare it to something else. How do you know something's a foot long? Because you got a ruler and you compare it to that. You can measure time. You can measure frequency. You can measure time away. You can measure by what you give up for it. Did you hear that? What would I give up for that love? If I had a choice of giving up my spouse for a million dollars, would I do it? Would I take the million dollars? Now, it's at this point they go, how soon? You know, you know you're in trouble. Would you do it for two million? That's a pretty good way of quantifying. Bring money into the equation. Would I give my spouse up for two million dollars? How about this? Here's one in the Fountainhead that I like. Gail Winan would buy off people supposedly who had integrity. He'd pay them an enormous sum of money to quit doing what they claim they loved. If you paid Picasso two million dollars to stop painting, would he do it? Three million, four million, five million. Say when? Six million. Seven million, eight million. If no money, no amount of money is enough, you know you got true love. And that's equally true with a job. How much money would I take never to engage in my career again in my life? A million? Two million? And he can't use the money? Yeah. Very, okay. Offer me a hundred dollar bill for that. I won't go in on that. That's a good thing to know, isn't it? Isn't it good to know how much? you enjoy your career. For example, when you say, I love my wife, how much? You know, what do you mean, how much? I said, how much do you love your wife? They give you something stupid like the moon and the stars, something that isn't theirs to give and they couldn't possibly put anywhere. Right? I love them more than the whole universe. Like, what's your alternative? I'll give up the universe, I'll live in non-existence as long as I live. <laughs> Run that by me another time. How much do you love your spouse? On a scale of one to 10, 10 is, my life would be totally empty without her. And the only time that life is totally like that is, as far as I can tell, is either just before your wife leaves you because you've been an SOB, or as you're falling in love. Other than that, the best you usually get is a nine. And that's okay, because a nine is great. A nine is great. A nine is I love my spouse very much and wouldn't give her up for less than no with the national product. Now, how much? How do you tell how much you love your spouse? By frequency? By time? By what you'd be willing to give her up for or him up? If somebody offered you $10,000 to spend a month away from your spouse and not be in contact, would you take it? I don't want your answer. Because I don't have the money. <laughs> how about $20,000? $50,000? $100,000 to spend a month away from your spouse? I have some people that go, I'd take $10,000. Fine. What would you take for half a year? 100,000, 150,000, 200,000. No contact, no letters, no time, whatever. How about a year? What would you take? That's a way of quantifying how much you like your spouse. Apply that to your job. I have a job that I wouldn't take any amount of money for to give up. Some of you remember a, a talk I used to give called the Judas Bargain. Remember the Judas Bargain? Who hasn't heard the story? Raise your hand if you haven't heard the story. All right, it's on my essence of fluid persuasion tape, but I'll tell it to you because I got the same offer again. I love it. You know, you know that you really love something is when you turn down serious money. I got offered 120 
thousand dollars a year U.S. What's that? One fifty Canadian. It's one hundred fifty thousand dollars a year to give up a career I like in exchange for a job that paid money, serious money. Try it like this. In the New Testament, the story went that there were a number of disciples. They hung out with Jesus. Right? They spent time preaching with him. All right. One of the disciples, Judas, was a social activist. He's sort of like these Marxist priests in South America. You know, do the stuff for the poor and screw the religion stuff. You know, that's just droppings in the background. Okay. Judas was talked to by the religious authorities, and the religious authorities said, hey, listen, you're right. Jesus is wrong. He's a great man. He's a great man. He's a great man. That's, that's what they always tell you just before they're going to stab you. You know, I really respect you. What's the next word? Right. You know, I, would, I wouldn't do anything to hurt you. And, and you know what that means is, but just means ignore the first half of the sentence. I'm going to get you. <laughs> All right, now what they did is they talked to Judas. This, tell you what. This guy has good message, very important, but look what you could do for the poor. We'll give you how many pieces of silver? 30 pieces of silver. We'll give you 30 pieces of silver, and you identify him to the authorities as the man who claimed to be the Messiah, the man who claimed to be the chosen. All you got to do now, Jesus, you agree, is the good. But look at all the good you can do with the $30. So Judas takes the money. The guards come to Gethsemane. He kisses him on the cheek. That identifies him. The guards take him off, and they crucify Jesus. So the story goes. Judas, the next morning, realizes that he sold out what's really important in exchange for a quick chunk of money. He goes and he tries to back out of the deal. He offers the money back to the religious authorities. They won't take it. No. Wrong. That's blood money. That's treasonous money. He throws the money into the temple. They won't even pick it up. They have servants, equivalent of AIDS victims. Pick it up. Lepers. Pick the money up because they won't touch it. Judas still can't handle it. So he goes out into the field and finds a tree with a cut-off limb, and he hangs himself. And the legend has it, the tree died too. We're offered the Judas bargain every day of our lives. When we sell out what's really important for a dollar, a hundred dollars, a thousand dollars, ten thousand dollars. We're offered it in our career and our personal life. The example that I had was, I was in the car business to pay off the Internal Revenue Service for a disputed debt. You know their idea of a debt is when the stick-up man doesn't find enough money in your wallet to justify pulling the gun and demands you go earn some more and come back the next night. That's the Internal Revenue Service's concept of a debt. I had to pay them off $47,000. No small tackle here. I negotiated it down to 18000 It's very important to negotiate even with thugs, sort of reduce the amount of looting. I was offered a job by a car dealership to be a finance manager. That's $120,000 U.S. a year. It's a 60-hour-a-week job, sometimes 70 hours, and I don't enjoy it. You know what went through my mind when it was offered? Well, look what I could do with the money. I could take the money and take a year off. I could take the money and go somewhere with my wife. But you work a 51-week year, 60, 70 hours a week, six-day work week. Anybody ever work those kind of hours? Raise your hands. Pretty tiring, isn't it? Don't have a lot of energy when it's over to go spend the money. Here was the deal. They offered me the Judas bargain. They said, sell out what's really important work that you love, with people you enjoy doing it with, work that satisfies you emotionally in exchange for the money. Well, all the money in the world won't buy back the misery you paid for it. All the money in the world can't buy you back the time, $100 million, and you can't buy back 70 hours, can you? Once it's gone, it's gone. I'd rather have somebody steal my money than steal my time, because I can always get the money back. That's never a problem. But I thought about it. I thought about $120,000. And then I thought about the deal that Judas made, 30 pieces of silver. All you got to do is sell out what's really important. But you know something? 
when you do that with your life, and you do that with your love, and you do that with your career, the money won't buy you anything that's worth having. And I gotta tell you something, the tree dies too. And you do a little bit each day. That's how I determined how much I loved writing and how much I enjoyed doing comedy and how much I enjoyed working with people is what I was offered in exchange for giving it up. And I said I wouldn't take it. And my wife asked me the obvious, how about a quarter of a million a year? Would you do that? And I answered no. How about a million? You'd only have to do it for a year. But you know what happens when you earn a million a year? Has anybody got anybody who's really earned a lot of money during the year? Does anybody know someone that has earned a bundle of money? What do they do with that money? They spend it. Almost everybody I know, my uh, client of mine is named Andre Maru. He's a former Alaska state legislator. He's a real estate broker. He's got a brother named Chris Maru, who is the best known newscaster in San Antonio, Texas. The guy makes $300,000 a year. Plus, he has a clothing allowance <laughs> to pay for that stuff he wears when he tells you the news. Hi, today people are dead. Don't I look great? Do you know how much his brother has in the bank? $380. $300,000. How much is that a week? What is that, about $6,000 a week? And he and his wife managed to spend all of it. You know what he's been telling himself for the last seven years? Next year I'll start saving up and then I'll do what I really want. And that's what happens when you make the Judas bargain. You try and buy back the happiness with the money. But that's a very good test for how much you like doing what you're doing. A good question to ask with regard to the Freedom Party is how much money would I take to sell out on principle? That's a good way of finding out whether it's really a principle or whether it's just a convenient belief. Would I take $1,000, $5,000, 10000 100000 to go be an NDP member? For how long? For how long? <laughs> I like that. Another man who's going to these are ways in which you quantify. You measure it against an alternative. These are ways in which you quantify. Now, there are a lot of different ways of evaluating. I like quantifying is a very good way. Comparing it against an alternative is another way. And you can do it with money. You can do it with time. You can do this with, I love the ultimate, the ultimate uh, story on that. A woman's at a party, a man walks up to her and says, would you go to bed with me for a million dollars? And she said, God, yes. He says, how about 50 bucks? She said, God, what kind of woman do you think I am? He said, we've already established that. We're just haggling about price. <laughs> the joke is funny because it's true. You know, a person that will sell out their country for a million bucks will also sell it for 100,000. Someone that will sell out their principles for a quick chunk of money a guy that will embezzle from a business just to get even really needs to reevaluate his principles. Now, we've all made mistakes. We've all made bad bargains. All of us have made little Judas bargains in our lives. Nothing wrong with acknowledging we've done that. Nobody's expected to be perfect. See, in life, perfection is not an option. We realize that perfection is not an option. All we can do is the best we can do. Nobody's asking you to start perfect or imperfect. Just get a little better tomorrow and a little better the next day. That's enough. And if you keep doing that every day, that's improvement, isn't it? See, the Freedom Party, some people say, I had a couple clients say, well, what are you going up and doing a weekend with the Freedom Party? How many people they got in? I said, I don't know, 400, 500? 400, 500. What a piss-ass little group. These are Republicans and Democrats. These are the kind of guys that would sell their soul for a nickel, right? And they're wondering about principle. And I said, you know, it's not really a matter of quantity. And it's not a matter of where you're at now. The question is, where are they going? And the answer is, maybe they've only got 400 members now, but I'll bet you a couple years from now they'll have like 600. How many is 600? I said, it's 200 more than 400. Yeah, well, then what? I said, then they'll probably get up to 1,000 or 2,000. Yeah, then what? I said, they'll be electing people. Then what? I said, once you build momentum, it's just a matter of time. Anybody ever see a football game where the momentum changes and you just watch and just blow the other team off the board? Basketball game, have you ever seen that? Or a hockey game, you just, your team's losing, your team's losing. Then somebody makes a breakaway play. Then the team gets hot and they can do no wrong. Once you get momentum, you can't lose. 
So I don't have to say how big is the Freedom Party today. All I have to say is it a little bigger than it was last time. Well, Robert, is it? That's right. I know that because I stay in touch. And is it going to be a little bigger next year? Oh, yeah. And is it going to be a little bigger the next year? Of course. That's progress, and that's all you can ever ask. So don't worry if you made the little Judas bargains. Just don't make them again. Sorry to make mistakes. Just don't make the same mistake twice, or three times, or four times, if you've already made it twice and three times before. Now, I want to show you how to quantify a few things. Now, what I'm talking about right here is how do you evaluate the importance of something? We're taught, we're not taught how to judge how important something is to us. We are not taught as kids how to judge. And we sort of treat it like some mystical feeling. Well, I know it's more important. Well, how do you know? How do you really know that that's more important to you? When somebody says, it's really important to me to be honest. All right, I got a question. If somebody says to you, honesty is an important thing to me, what's the question I would ask? How important? OK. And then I would ask the question, how do you know how important it is? That's a weird question. That's a quantifying, mind-focused question. How important is it? And how do you know how important it is? Now, the question is, how do you measure how important something is to you? We did it on love. How do you do it with money? What are you willing to give up for the money? Very good. What would you do for it? What would you do for it? That's a very good test. What would you do for a million dollars? Remember the old movie, t TV show, The Millionaire? You remember that, Robert? Remember that? This guy worked for a guy named Mr. Anthony, Michael Anthony and a millionaire. This guy would give him a certified check for a million dollars to give to some people who did nothing to earn it. And Michael Anthony would give them the million dollars on the condition they not tell anybody where it came from. And he would watch them, and the whole show would develop around what happened to their life and what changes did they make. And most of the people turned out to be pretty petty and little. But some of them turned out to be real heroes, what they did with a million dollars. During one of the show, the multimillionaire was sitting down, and you only saw his hands or his chest in his hands. And Michael Anthony says to him, why do you give him a million dollars? He said, Mr. Anthony, have you ever eaten a banana? Yeah. He said, did you ever peel a banana? Yeah. Why'd you peel the banana? He says, well, to get out what's inside. Exactly. Money's a good way of finding out what gets inside. What would you do for the money? What would you do for it? Good test to find out your level of commitment to the Freedom Party is what? Give me a few tests that you would give. How would you tell your level of commitment? No wrong answers. How much test? How yes. What? What? How much money you gave? Proportion to how much you have. That's fair. Yes? Amount of time you have. Amount of time you give, okay. Other. You talk about it. What? You talk about the teachers. Exactly. You talk about it to people. Okay. What else would you do? What would you be willing to do for it? What would you be willing to do for it? Okay. What else? How else would you determine how important it is to you? How often you think about it. How often you think about it. That might be very appropriate. Now stop a second. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Just come out from the other way and say, what would it take to get you to pull you away from it? Very good. What would it take to totally tempt you away from the Freedom Party? That's a way of testing how important. You want to find out how good your romance is? Get tempted. Get really tempted. I got the great temptation. I don't know if I've told you this weird temptation. I've always had. I, I usually deal with temptation in the Mae West way. I give in. <laughs> It might not come my way twice. It's very important. I'm teasing, I'm teasing. I got the ultimate temptation. A lady I was dating in Dallas, Texas, this is back in like 1981. Her daddy was a multi-millionaire. She had a trust fund. She also had a vacant head. But she had a trust fund, and she would support me so I could do what I want. All I had to do was spend time with her and her friends. Not even close to being tempting. I wouldn't want to spend time with her. She was the most beautiful woman in my, I, second most beautiful woman I've ever met. I take that back. No, no, I'm not talking about my wife. My wife is nice, but she's not the most beautiful woman in the world. I'm, I met another woman more beautiful than her.
But this woman was really good looking, but you know, she hit her head against objects and you could hear echoes. <laughs> right. That's a good way of finding out how tempted I was. I wasn't even mildly tempted. So that wasn't even close to being a good temptation. Now, I want to talk about how you quantify. We talked about, I'm asking you questions because there aren't any wrong answers in, in determining how you evaluate. I'm just giving you different ways of judging how important something is. Now, has anybody ever negotiated for anything? Ever negotiated for anything? Okay. You all negotiate every day. You know the only difference between the people who didn't raise their hands and the people who did? Is the people who raised their hands knew they were negotiating and the other people didn't. You negotiate every single day. What do you want for dinner? Oh, spaghetti. We don't have any spaghetti. Well, let's go get some. I don't want to. Well, suppose I get the wine and you get the spaghetti. Would that work? That's a negotiation, isn't it? Every day when you go to work, that's a negotiation. How do I know that? Well, no, I've already made my deal on how much I get. What do you negotiate every day when you go in for work? Even if you don't know you're negotiating it, you're doing it every single day. What is it? Getting out of bed. What? Getting out of it? Is that what you said? Out of bed. Out of bed? That's a good negotiation. That's a hurdle you negotiate. What do you negotiate every day when you're at work? Your assignments for the day. Your assignments for the day. You ever have your boss dump extra stuff? If you're not too busy, would you mind doing this? Excuse me, I'll be more than happy to do this, but I'll have to give up this. Would you like to take these and give them to someone else? See, you either negotiate for what you get or you take what you get. I like negotiating for what I get because I get better stuff than if I get what I get. Does that make sense? Did you get it? Okay. Every day you negotiate what time you show up for work. How do I know that? Because you try and show just a smidge early, a smidge late. What can you negotiate with in terms of work? What's negotiable in work? Deadlines. Big part? Go. Level of energy put into the work. Level of energy put into the work. What else is negotiable about your work? And that can be any component of the work, either with your customers or with your boss. Yes? Deadlines. What? Deadlines. What's a certain amount of work is supposed to be done? You know, give me that script by Friday. Oh, by Friday. Deadline? When it's due? Okay. What else is negotiable? Come on. There's no wrong answer. There's no wrong answer. That's a wrong answer. Uh -oh. Just testing. Yes? The quality of the work. You know, Nathaniel Brandon used to have this argument with Ayn Rand. Rand used to demand that he have certain stuff in by a certain day, and he was trying to do new theoretical work on the psychology of self-esteem. And so he was continually being light. And he finally sat down with her and said, look, Ayn, do you want art or do you want it Tuesday? <laughs> and they negotiated somewhere between art and That was the item of negotiation. What else is negotiable about your work? Name me a few things that are negotiable about your work. What you do. What else? When you do it. How you do it. Where. He's got the key questions. How much you get paid for it. Michael's rule is everything is negotiable. Now, I'm going to show you how to focus some attention on how negotiable it is. Every job in the world has negotiable elements, even jobs with fixed salaries. We're sorry, the salary for your position is X. Does anybody ever have a boss say, I'm sorry, you're at the top level that's appropriate for your division? Here's a Michael sneaky technique. I understand that, and I agree. I wouldn't expect you to pay more than the position allows. However, I've got a problem in that I need additional money, and I'm willing to give additional value. How would you suggest we go about doing that? Now, did you see what I just did to him? I just gave him a problem to solve. You know what people do when you give them problems? They solve them. Maybe they'll redefine your job, or maybe they'll give you different responsibilities. Maybe they'll move you laterally and say, well, if you do part of this and part of that. Well, I agree that a grade five couldn't possibly get more than a $15,800 a year, and I wouldn't expect you to do that. But what if we did a, a grade five Z2 that also has additional responsibilities and in exchange for it gets an extra 3000 How about that? Is that negotiable? Sure it is. Why? Because nobody's ever asked it. What else is negotiable about your job? Salary? 
is one negotiable item. How about fringe benefits? Are those negotiable? Has anybody negotiated fringe benefits? Okay. How do you negotiate salary? And let's let's talk about let's talk about how we negotiate money. Let's, money is the area where most people get upset. Is that right? Agree or disagree? When you're negotiating money, you can negotiate one of two parts of money easily. One is how much money you get for what I'm giving you. And the other is how I structure what I give you for the money you're willing to give. Well, if you're only willing to give me $15,800 a year for my job, would you mind if I could get the job done in four days a week? If I only worked four days a week, would that be okay with you? Where's the rule that says you can't do that? Robert knows about this. Wasn't part of your original agreement with the Freedom Party you'd be there certain hours in the office? What happened later on? Didn't you renegotiate? You, you don't always have to negotiate the money. Renegotiate the terms, not just the money. Now, I'm going to show you some mind-focused ways of doing this. See, the difficulty is we look at money as one big chunk, as job as one big chunk. You don't restructure the money, you restructure the deal. You restructure the terms. Anybody ever hear the following sentence? That's too much from your boss. You're asking for too much. That's too much. You ever done that with a car? That's too much for the car. Mm -hmm. That's too much for the house. That's too much for that kind of activity. That's too much for the plumbing job. Let me give you a sentence that's lots of fun. How much too much is it? I agree, that probably is too much. How much too much is it? Write that sentence down. If that sounds like a weird sentence, let's try it. All right, when you're buying the car, did you expect to get it for free? Does your boss expect you to work for nothing? No. Do you expect to pay zero for the boat? No. Not, you're not NDP members, so I know you can't expect it for zero. Paid for by someone else. That's too much for the house. How much too much is it? Now people, when you ask that question, immediately freak. They give me the look like you do, that blank-eyed look. How much too much is it? Well, they must have an idea of what's just right. Otherwise, they couldn't say that's too much, could they? All right? If you know what's just the right amount of food on your plate, then you know that that amount more is too much, right? That's too much ice cream. Well, how much too much is it? Well, that's one scoop too many. That's too much money for, uh, for a uh, 1973 Ford Pinto, $500. How much too much is it? Is it $10 too much? $500 too much. It's $500 too much. The man's right. <laughs> Six. <laughs> What am I doing? I'm quantifying the too much objection. You're asking us to give too much time to the Freedom Party, Robert. And Robert says, how much too much time am I asking you to give? Would you rather give two, two less hours a week? Would that be better? Instead of giving, you know, like 22 hours a day and sleeping on the floor, would it be all right if just give one hour less? Would that be all right? or one less hour. You need to know how much too much it is. Because if they don't have an idea of just right, they can't know what too much is. But that's a weird question to ask, isn't it? You wouldn't have thought of it if I didn't ask it. And that's why I asked it. Because it lets you focus on the important thing, the difference between just right and too much. Because between just right and too much, guess what? It's negotiable. That's why you paid more for the car than you wanted, but less than they wanted, right? That's why you paid more for the house than you wanted, but less than they wanted, right? That's why you got less for your job than you could have because you're unwilling to negotiate between what they wanted and you wanted. Because you're afraid they might not hire you. And you're afraid if you went in and asked for the raise, the boss might go, you're asking too much. How much too much am I asking, sir? His eyes would glaze over and say, well, surely you realize the additional value I'm giving the company. And I know you value good employees, sir. You've always said it. You say it in all the meetings, and I know that you mean it. This is called setting him up. How much too much is that? Were you thinking of giving me a $2,800 raise instead of a $3,000 raise? Hmm? And what do you do after you ask the question? Now, what happens to the person who talks first? They lose. So make sure they talk first. Yeah. You can do this in negotiation. 
for example, you're not giving me enough. You're in there buying something. And you can do this in comic books, but not in anyone here that owns a comic book store. In other comic book stores, you can negotiate. For example, they can negotiate quantity. I do that all the time. How much for uh, one pair of pants? And I go, it's 20 bucks. What kind of a discount will you give me if I buy three pairs? This is Sears. I, I know it is. I saw the sign when I walked in the door. Now, how much of a discount would you be willing to give me? Has anybody here ever negotiated with Sears? I have. I've won. Has anybody ever negotiated with JCPenney's? I have. You know why I do it? It's fun. Because they think you can't negotiate with Sears, don't you? I haven't tried it at McDonald's yet, and I don't want to. Because no matter what they give me, it's too much. <laughs> how much too much? All of it. Okay. You can negotiate quantity, time, when you get it, when you deliver it. For example, I have a printer that says, if you take it three days from now, this is the price. If you need it this afternoon, this is the price. And I say, I like it, but what if I take it tomorrow? Says, what do you mean? I said, there's got to be somewhere between here and here, isn't there? Well, yeah. Oh, what do you think? Somewhere between this number? Would it be closer to this number or that number? You're getting people to quantify it, to put a number on it. We don't, we're not very precise in our questions, are we? A lot of times we go, how much for the sweater? Don't we? And we just pick them up and pay at the cash register on high ticket items, don't we? And we just, what's the highest ticket item in our life? Think about it a second. What's the highest ticket item in our life? What? Say what? Nope. Highest ticket item in your life that you negotiate? your life. What you sell your time to your employer for. I cheated. That was a good second guess. Food was second to life. Because if you don't have the food, the life is non-negotiable. It dies, right? I'm teasing. All right. In fact, your highest negotiated item is your salary for your job. And the terms for your job. And the conditions under which you work for your job. How many days a week you work. I mean, where is it written you have to work five days a week, eight hours a day? I read the Ten Commandments. It's not listed as a footnote. I've got to tell you. Everything is negotiable. And if you can focus your boss's attention on the details. Now, let me tell you a few things about negotiation that's important. If your boss offers you a package. Here's our employment package. You ever hear that phrase? Here's what we offer. Well, you've got to accept before it's an accepted offer. That's good. First thing you want to do is break the package down into parts. Negotiate each part separately. Now, if you're selling it, do it the opposite. Negotiate none of it separately. Negotiate it as a package. With a job, what does that entail? When you come in. Has anybody ever negotiated on when they're allowed to show up for work? OK. When, is, when did they want you to come in for work? 7.30. When did you want to come in? 7.30. You negotiated. That was when you wanted to come in. Mm -hmm. OK, they wanted you to come in at 7.30. Yeah. All right. Which is against the collective agreement. Is it? What time do you have to come in? Around 8.30. Around 8.30. Okay. Did, who won the negotiation, incidentally? Well, we both wanted the same thing, but it was against the collective agreement. So you both got screwed by the union? No, we both did it and never told the union. All right. <laughs> Silence also is not only golden, but it's negotiable. Well, what did you have to negotiate with the job? The time? Was it the time? Yeah, the time. What time did they want you in? What time did you want to come in? Okay. And did you want to leave earlier? On Fridays. On Fridays, were you able to negotiate it? Good. Did they get what they wanted out of the deal? Not really. Did Did you produce the results they wanted? Yeah. Then they got what they wanted. <laughs> I guess they did. I mean, think about it. I mean, I don't believe in the labor theory value. Eight hours of uh, Einstein's time is worth a lot more than eight hours of the garbage collector's time. Would we agree? Yeah. Right. Eight hours of Picasso painting is worth more than eight hours of Sherman and Williams on a wall painting. Would we agree? All right. Yeah, it depends on which, which day of the month. Yeah, OK. All right, now, so who says you can't negotiate for results instead of time? I negotiate with clients. I have people, I have customers ask me, I write speeches, and I charge somewhere between 50 and 80 cents US a word. I do this with doctor and lawyers. This is my, uh, I'm a practicing Marxist. I don't know if you know that. I'm redistributing the wealth from the rich, them, to someone less rich, me. <laughs> I'm only disagreeing about the means. I'm using trade or exchange. I have physicians ask me, well, how long will it take you to write a speech? 
Has anybody ever had a boss ask you, how long will it take you to do the job? All right? If you're getting paid for the results, it's none of his goddamn business. I'll tell you a story that, uh, who's the, the blind pianist? Ray Charles. Ray Charles was once asked, he says, he says, Mr. Charles, does it ever bother you to get up on stage and play for 40 minutes and pay you $10,000? He says, oh, shit. He says, I play on the stage for nothing. I love to do that. The $10,000 is for all the years I had to put up with shit and had to practice. That's what they're paying for. Well, what they're paying for when they pay for your job is also all the training that led up to the point where you can get the job done in three hours or four hours or five hours or how well it is. Should you be penalized for being efficient? You are if you get paid by the hour, aren't you? But suppose you... You negotiate the results, and I do this with clients. I'll have this speech done by this amount, and we'll negotiate the price on it. If I get it done in eight hours, I win, and so do they. If it takes me five weeks, I win, and so do they, but I don't win near as much, because it shouldn't take me that long to do it. I practice hard, so it doesn't take me that long. You can negotiate results. Who says you can't negotiate for results on your job? If you're in sales, is anybody here in sales? You're in sales, you guys sell comic books to people. You sell also, you sell culture. I like that, you sell ambiance. I love ambiance. All right, you're in sales. All right. When you're in sales, who negotiates your salary? Who determines your salary by and large? You do if you're in sales, you sure do. What happens if you do a real cruddy job in your sales? They dehire you. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me, they give you a new opportunity to job seek in the market. They do this real nice instead of saying, you're out, bumstead. They give you phrases like, we need to give you job uh, counseling for career restructuring. What's that mean? Goodbye. <laughs> All right, what happens if you do really well in selling? You get promoted usually, don't you, if you want it. Or they cut commission. Or they cut commission. A lot of companies do that. You know how to, you know how to teach them not to do that? Quit. Go talk to the owner and say, I want you to know why I'm going to be working for your competitor and eating your lunch. It's because you've been screwing with me, and I want you to know every time when your company's profit's going down, it's me doing it. Have a nice day. Do you know who did that to IBM? H. Ross Perot. You ever hear of H. Ross Perot? The billionaire computer guy? He worked for IBM after he got out of the military. And you know what happened? IBM has a limit to how much a computer salesperson can make. At the time, this is in the early 60s, the limit was $50,000 a year. Guess why they have a ceiling to how much you can make selling the systems? Does anybody want to take a wild guess? Probably can't computerize that amount of money. Nope. Because some corporate vice president was going to be damned if a goddamn salesman was going to earn more than he did. I've been here 25 years, and I'm going to be damned if I'm going to let a slimy, you know, you've got to remember, salesmen are shit. That's the attitude of executives. Because they can't earn the money and can't do the job. You doubt it, they say, I, I should earn that amount of money. Come on into sales. Doors open. You set your own salary. H. Ross Perot met the salary limit in March of the year. <laughs> he went to the head of IBM, who was Watson at the time, who was getting on. That was junior, I believe. And he said, uh, I've already hit my limit, and uh, I want you to raise it. And Watson says, that's a policy. Now, what do we know about policies? They're the products of negotiation, and they're able to be renegotiated. However, Watson was not paying attention this year. And Watson said to him, we're sorry, our official policy is the limit is $50,000 a year. You'll have to spend the rest of the year servicing accounts. So Perot said, well, it's been a pleasure working for you. I'd like my $50,000 in 30 days, and I'll see you. And he went and set up a competitor. And Watson kicked himself in the butt every week for allowing that to happen because of some envious VP. Okay. Now, you can quantify anything, you can measure anything, you can evaluate anything. Negotiations in area, how many of you have trouble negotiating? How many feel a little uncomfortable with it? It's all right. I want to give you some techniques and mind focus techniques for negotiating. First thing is, if you're talking about a high ticket item, this is a technique that I learned from a guy named Roger Dawson. It's called the flinch. 
When they tell you the price is $150,000, I want you to go, $150,000? And they shut up. Because a lot of times they go, $130,000? That was a pretty cheap gesture, wasn't it? $150,000, I got paid $20,000 for that. Al Pacino doesn't get paid $20,000 for a solder shrug. You're applying for a job. The salary is between eighteen dollars and $24,000. You go, $24,000? Well, we could see our way to doing $27,000. I taught that to a guy at a seminar not less than six months ago. He called me up and told me he got $4,000 more with that one gesture from a company that never negotiated. They swore they never negotiated. Oh, yeah? What do you call that? Well, we redetermined the job specifications and a new classification. <laughs> yeah, right. They negotiate. All right, that's a feedback technique. I couldn't vote for the Freedom Party. You couldn't vote for the Freedom Party? Well, maybe I could if. All right, they just started negotiating. I couldn't join the Freedom Party. You couldn't join the Freedom Party? Did you hear what I did? All I did was fed them back a question statement in a question form. And then they say, well, maybe I could if. Now you're negotiating. Now, what are you trying to do when you're negotiating? You're trying to set up terms that work for you and work for them. Is that right? You're a fool if you only set up terms that work for you because it won't keep you. Right? You don't want to be foolish. You don't outsmart yourself, do you? Now, this is also a real great line. Guys, if you ever have a woman shut you down in a bar, I had to tell us to Mark, he'd do this. You ever have a woman shut you down in a bar, you're minding your own business having a drink, and you hit on the woman next to you and she says, I wouldn't go out with you if you're the last guy on the planet. Stand up and go, a hundred dollars? And leave. I, I would never recommend anything like that, but I'll guarantee it works like a charm. Everyone will look at her for about an hour. <laughs> Anyway, in negotiating, what you're trying to do is you're trying to structure things in a way that they work. All mind focus does is it enables you to be more precise about what's acceptable. That's too much money for the job. Well, how much too much is it? Now look at it and you go, well, I know you didn't expect to get it for free. And I know you didn't expect to pay a million dollars for it. I know that. I, ex I understand that. So how much too much is it? You're getting them to quantify it, to get something and bite your teeth into it. I mean, how do you deal with an objection like, I could never join the Freedom Party? What do you know about them? How much information have they given you? None. You've got nothing there. I could never join the Freedom Party. Of course, I might, you could never, ever, under any circumstances, in any lifetime, join the Freedom Party? Well, I could if. Now you're negotiating. Well, would you like to come to a meeting and discuss it? Negotiation is a matter of determining what is acceptable to you and what is acceptable to them. Here are a few ways of understanding what you're negotiating. You've got to remember all the different things you can negotiate. You can negotiate results, time, terms, conditions, frequency. You can negotiate fringe benefits. How many times have you gone into a clothing store, bought a uh, coat, trousers, shirt, three shirts, Take it up just while they're writing it up and say, throw in a tie for nothing. I like doing that at expensive stores. It drives them nuts. And tell them it's got to be silk. I'm sorry, we don't dicker. I understand that. I wouldn't expect it to. It's a high-class store. I expect that to be a complimentary tie. <laughs> Could you ask the owner whether he would do that as a courtesy to a valued customer who has not yet paid? <laughs> it works. It works. And you walk out if they turn you down? No, no. I never walk out when a clerk turns me down because there's always, you got to remember, in any job, everybody can say no. This is a rule, first rule, is everybody, no matter what level, the guy sweeping the floor, can I get a tie? Nah, shut up. Get out of here. All right. The salesperson, does he own the store? Is that his coat and tie? I mean, it's not like he's pulling it out of his own closet at home, right? That's the boss's tie, or the owner's tie. Ask talk to the boss. He's not here. Who's in charge now? I am. They trusted you with this story? No, no, I'm not. I'm teasing. I'm teasing. Don't do that. 
don't do that. that. You don't need to give them self-esteem problems. That's my job. And you won't get the and, tie. And you won't get the tie anyway, right? You'll have bad self-esteem and you won't get the tie and won't buy the clothes. Yeah. Ask them who's in charge. Then ask the person to come out and say, it's a pleasure to meet you. You know, I'm, I'm about to become a brand new valued customer. The first buying decision I've made in your store and the beginning of a good long-term relationship if I really like this. Oh, really? Absolutely. I'm buying this and this and this and this. And uh, you look like someone who can make decisions. Isn't that true? And they'll go, yes, even if they can't. Even if they can't. Now you've totally set them up. Then I'd like you to make the decision to throw in a complimentary tie. This one. How about it? And they'll go, no. And you go, come on, you're kidding me about being in charge, weren't you? You can't do it. You don't have the authority. And to prove they have the authority, they'll give you the tie. Even if they have to shoplift it out. Oh, I'm not recommending that in your business. No, they won't do that. Okay. It's all negotiable. You can negotiate anything. And what you're trying to do is quantify what you get for what you give. Okay. Now, let's look at the how, what, when, where, and uh, when questions. You have people say, we never discount this. Now, what was the mind focus question that I gave you yesterday? How do you give them? Never. Never, ever, under any circumstances in the history of this store, have you ever had a sale? Well, there was once, blah, 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 blah. Every store has a sale. Even the, you notice even the best stores in town have sales? You notice that? Has anybody ever seen a, a jewelry store not have a sale? How many of you know that Cartier's has had sales? It's true. I'm not making this up. Mercedes-Benz, do you know that's negotiable? You know BMW's negotiable? God, if those high-ticket items are negotiable, everything's got to be negotiable, right? I mean, even Donald Trump is negotiable. Okay, now, what you're trying to do is quantify. We never do that, sir. You never, ever. How about this? It's store policy that we do thus? What's a mind focus question? It's store policy not to discount. Why is it store policy? Uh -huh. Remember, why is not a question. You might, you might ask, how is store policy determined? Or, what are your exceptions to store policy? Or, is store policy ever provide? Very good, that's a very nice focus question. Excellent. Who has the authority to override store policy? Notice, not does anybody. Who has the authority to override store policy? Do you have authority to make certain decisions your employees do not? I know that when I come into your store, guess who I'm going to talk to? Not only because I got a missly good taste, but because they have no authority to say yes. You got to remember, there's in every business there's someone with the authority to say yes. You guys have people working for you in your in your uh, comic book business. All right. A lot of times it's their job basically to ring up stuff and make sure the kids don't shove stuff down their pants and walk out with it, right? <laughs> Man, I've been in the book business. I know that stuff works, right? But if somebody comes in and wants to make a big purchase, three or four or five, or a big sale, and they want to work a good deal out, they talk to you, right? I mean, that would be the right thing for them to do. Those of you who are buying comic books, deal with the clerks and pay the full price. These guys need the money. But everybody else in the world, we need to know that, right? That's equally true of someone selling a whole bunch of comics to you, collector's items, right? You want to see them. You want to judge the quality. You want to negotiate, don't you? Exactly. There's always someone in higher authority. You can work your way all up to the federal government here. You can go all the way to Ottawa. I'm sorry, if I let you, I'd have to let everybody do it. You know, everybody gives you lines like that. We can't make an exception, all right? Here's a mind focus line. I'm sorry, try this at the library. We can't make an exception. What's a mind focus question? Who can? We can't make an exception. Well, probably there's someone who can make an exception. I'll bet if the premier called down here, by God, they'd make a, an exception. Maybe if the mayor called down, they'd make an exception. Maybe if I called down pretending to be a mayor, they'd make an exception. I don't know. Who can make an exception? Or when have you made an exception in the past? Who made the exception? Who has the authority to make an exception? What am I doing? I'm testing their assumptions. Every statement is an assumption. Now, this is true in negotiating. It's true in romance. Honey, this is not working out. It isn't. 
what specifically isn't working out? Well, this and this and this. What would we need to do in order to work those things out? Those are ways of focusing our attention on the real issues and the real problems and the real solutions. They're a way of concentrating our attention, just like a magnifying glass concentrates light to a point where it can cause some additional heat. Just the same way as a laser concentrates energy in such a way as to produce results that could be produced just in the normal atmosphere. Now, you can quantify anything. You can negotiate anything. You can restructure anything, whether it's political or personal. For example, suppose you're working on a political issue. I want to back up and go to politics for a second. If you're working on a political issue and you find out that the electorate is absolutely unwilling to consider Sunday openings for everybody, what do you negotiate? Sunday openings for somebody. Sunday openings for somebody. Drive a wedge in there. How about for small bookstores? I noticed that Mark is open on Sunday. Do we think this is just a matter of chance and coincidence that this applies to small bookstores of which the biggest pain in the butt happens to be an owner of one? Do we think this is just a matter of chance that he got an opening that just happens to apply to bookstores? Who thinks it's a matter of chance? I want to show you some swamp lands. <laughs> Especially since the premier is from London. Especially since the premier is from London. Because it didn't, it didn't hit the Toronto papers at all. Didn't hit the Toronto? What not a that I saw. Well, it did, not very much. Yeah, my right. page someplace where nobody ever sees it. So it didn't get lots of coverage in Toronto, but I guess the premier being from here, he noticed it. If he hadn't been, if he'd been from Cornwall or something, it probably wouldn't have worked. Let's look at a separate issue. We can't change the law now. What's a mind focus question? When can we? When can we? That isn't open for discussion tonight. When will it be? When will it be open for discussion? We don't know. When can we discuss? When we'll know. How can we determine when we'll know? When would be a good day to schedule it so that we can all be here and have a nice, friendly discussion? <laughs> Me and about 50 of our protesting friends and you all alone. I mean that in a friendly, kindly way. You can do that with any policeman. You can do that with any politician. You can do that with any bureaucrat. Has anybody ever got a traffic ticket, speeding? How do you negotiate it? You paid it. Next thing I know, you're gonna. Next thing I know, that I'm gonna be dating a Jewish girl. She's gonna pay full list. Don't hurt my feelings like that. Never pay those. Now, I don't mean drive around without paying the ticket. Let me give you an example. I got a traffic ticket for doing 70, 69 miles an hour in a 45 zone in Las Vegas. 45 miles per hour versus 69. 24 miles an hour over the speed limit. Sounds like a cut and dried case, doesn't it? Now I figured this, I figured, how do they get people to pay these fines? Well, they throw them in jail or they do things to them. But I thought, does, is anybody able? First question I ask is, does everybody pay the ticket? And the answer is no. Well, how do you get from paying the ticket? Well, you go to court and you plea bargain. You hear about plea bargain. If murderers can plea bargain, by God, speeders can. Would you agree? All right, I went to court and I found that there's this huge line of people waiting to either pay their fine or set a court date. Do you have that in your system? You have a line of people that are waiting to do it? I'm fighting a ticket and I get my court date on June 25th. Excellent. That's a good time to have it. I just, it's next year. It's as good as the 26th. I discovered that there was a separate line for lawyers. Lawyers shouldn't have to wait in line, right? It's just us peons. So I figured out, why would they allow a big, long line of civilians? You know what the answer is? Because some people go, the hell with it. I'm not waiting an hour. I'll just So I figured, why should I be the fool that says that? I should be the guy that dresses up like a lawyer. So I walked to the front of the line. I said, hi, I'm with Barrister and Barrister. I need to set a... <laughs> the girl might have been a high school grad, but she didn't even know what the word meant. And I said, I need to set a court date for my client. When's good? And she said, uh, tomorrow at 9 o'clock. I said, can you make sure I'm first on the calendar? I didn't know whether she could or couldn't, but I just asked. And she said, of course. And I said, well, thank you very much. We really appreciate it. 
picked up my date. I said, you don't need a bond, do you? She says, oh, no, your word's good, right? A lawyer? <laughs> You're going to believe a lawyer, right? This is a really good thing. This is the kind of person that trusts Nixon with money, right? This is really brain dead, right? But they trust a lawyer, but they don't trust the civilians, normal people. So I left. I came in the next day. I was at the front of the line. I started discussing with the judge. And he said, we've got a lot of people here. And I said, Your Honor, I understand that. And that's why the sooner we get this done, the sooner we'll be able to get to them. So I took up his time, so his court started getting backed up. But Your Honor, I, all I'm saying is I was not going 69 miles an hour. The policeman isn't even here. Well, he signed an affidavit saying that. Sir, have you ever had an instance when one of your policemen was mistaken? I asked him mind focus questions. Well, yeah, I have. Sir, have you ever had a situation where a policeman pointed the radar gun at the wrong car? Yes, I have. Sir, have you ever had an instance where you had a police officer lean the truth a little? Yeah, I have. Sir, would I take up your time like this if it weren't really important to me? No. <laughs> he was wrong. <laughs> but it sounded like a good question. And then I said, Your Honor, I don't expect you to sanction someone speeding. I don't believe I was speeding. I was not looking at my speedometer, but I don't believe I was speeding. I was going with the flow of the traffic. I believe I was doing the speed limit. I said, what can you do for me? That's an all-purpose question. He could have said, I can charge you the full fine, yeah. but he didn't. He said, how about if we show 10 miles an hour with the speed limit? I said, Your Honor, if that's the case, I'm going to have to ask for a jury trial because I wasn't speeding. I'm going to have to call the policeman off the street, keep him away from pursuing criminals for at least an hour, maybe two, and get all my questions answered because, Your Honor, I was not speeding. I don't believe. I'm not trying to be obstinate because I respect you. What can you really do for me? No, what can you do now? What can you really do? He says, what if we give you a parking fine for 20? I said, no speeding points on my record? He said, no. I said, Your Honor, you're a gentleman. I really appreciate it. And left. It took me 15 minutes. I went from like a $95 fine to a $20 fine and no increase in my insurance. <laughs> Breaking the law is negotiable, too. Yes? I think so. <laughs> I, I couldn't tell him that he had no right to own the roads, and therefore it was a moot point. <laughs> right? So, you know, I, I don't want to get into the heavy esoteric questions. I probably was doing somewhere around there. I don't know. Yes? Uh, if you're under 21, you, you know, you're the yeah. ultimate of peon. You know, you've got no rights. They, I, as a kid, I got uh, pulled over with my brother and had the car searched for marijuana. And if you know anything about me and marijuana, I can't smoke this stuff. I'm allergic to it. I'm really allergic to it. I had a car searched when we were parked in a parking lot. Park in a parking lot. Ah, uh -huh. a non-moving violation. <laughs> now, now, what was I doing? I was continually asking them to test their experience. I asked the judge, have you ever had an instance of? The policeman wouldn't have written the ticket if it weren't the case. Sir, have you ever had a policeman write a ticket when it wasn't the case? Maybe he had a bad day? Maybe he was paying attention to something else. Maybe something was bothering him. You know, a lot of policemen have a lot of stress, sir. You've seen that, haven't you? Yeah, well, I have. Is it possible that he maybe had a stressful day? Not that he's a bad guy, but he just had a stressful day. Well, yeah. If he did have a stressful day, you wouldn't want to give me a ticket unnecessarily, would you? Well, no. And I wouldn't be here if I didn't really believe that I was right, would I? And he said no, and I, that was the right answer, but it was a wrong answer. And we negotiated the ticket. It's all negotiable. Your taxes are. Those are negotiable. If you get audited, you're going to fake it a certain amount. OK. Now, what am I doing with these mind-focused questions? I'm enabling people to compare their beliefs against reality. I'm asking them to quantify their beliefs. These are, to me, these are very obvious. I do these as a way of life. I'm continually asking questions. Someone says, I think you're cute. I said, so how cute do you think I am? <laughs> I, that's a fun question to ask, because you get the people smile at you just like you two smiled at me. And then they, then they, then they give you really neat answers. They, they go, well, I, I think you got a real cute butt. I said, oh, that's neat. You like it if I wear tighter pants? <laughs> they go, oh, you're rotten, right? And then you get to have a neat conversation that nobody else thought of having, right? Or if you have somebody think, D don't try this while you're drinking. You're drunk, honey. How drunk, too drunk am I, you know? If she's smart, she'll push you out the car door and make you walk home until you sober up. But what you're asking, what are you doing with mind-focused questions? You're asking people to be more precise about what they mean. You're asking them to compare their beliefs to reality, to their real experience. Johnny hit me. 
Well, did he hit you with a, you know, how did he hit you? Well, he had a rolled up copy of Superman and hit me. Well, that's not, if you're, you know that's not very hard, right? But if you say he hit me and you find out it was a, with a brick, Johnny's going to get an ass beat, right? In a very gentle, non-violent, non-coercive way. You're gonna, what you're going to do is privatize his butt for about three minutes. It's a way of finding out what really went on. It's a way of redetermining the facts. Now, to do that, you measure, you compare, you quantify, and you continually test everything that they're saying on important issues. I don't mean every time someone says, it's a nice day, isn't it? How nice is it? <laughs> How do you know it's a nice day? This is the kind of thing that causes, you know, Mr. Rogers to deck the four-year-old kid. How's this for nice, kid? Whack! Whack! Actually, I, uh, I'm a collector of uh, unusual things. I'm a, I have a photograph of Norman Rockwell striking a small child. It's worth millions. <laughs> I have a picture of Mother Teresa refusing bread to a starving orphan. You know. It's... Now, what we're doing with how, what, when, where, and uh, how, what, when, where, what I leave out? Who? No? Who? Who? Who, thank you. And who questions is, we want to be very precise in our communications. Do you notice how you overgeneralize sometimes? OK. Do you notice how you exaggerate sometimes? Never. Never? Never, I love it. You know, I, I like this when I, I've done this with my objectivist friends. I, people say, I think it's very important to be objective. You think it's always important under all circumstances to always be totally, completely, thoroughly objective with no mistakes ever forgiven? And if they're real randroids, they go, of course. <laughs> then I know they're beyond redemption. And they go, well, mostly. Then you know they're dealable with. And you know that they're using it as something that enhances their life. Now, time is up. Stage 46, good. What we're trying to do with mind focus, what we're attempting to do is use questions to determine what we know and what we don't know. And what's more important, what they know and what they don't know. Now, I want to give you a few different ways of analyzing what people are saying. OK. I want to distinguish between perception and meaning. Perception and meaning, or perception and interpretation. My wife is angry with me is an interpretation, usually, unless your wife tells you she's angry with you, in which case it's a serious fact that you better pay attention to. Johnny doesn't care about me. Okay. Now, when someone gives you a statement about someone, you can tell it's an interpretation or a meaning rather than a perception when they stay away from non-sensory based terms. When they don't use words like see, when they don't use things that you can see or hear or touch. Johnny hates me. How do you know he hates you? Well, he never talks to me. Notice, he never ever under any circumstances talks to you. Well, he hardly ever talks to me, and when I talk to him, he turns his back and walks off. Now you've got the sensory data, right? Now you know what happens. You talk to Johnny, he turns around and walks off. The interpretation is he doesn't like me. That may be a correct interpretation. I'm not telling you it's not. But you need to know what the real evidence is for it, don't you, in order to make a clear understanding? My husband doesn't love me. How do you know he doesn't love you? Well. He never talks to me after dinner. Never talks to you ever under any circumstances after you've eaten dinner? Well, sometimes he doesn't. When he doesn't, what happens before he doesn't? Well, I discipline the kids. Well, for all you know, she's come up with the image of the bitch from hell, and he doesn't want to deal with that. No, honey, I don't think it's time to talk. I think it's very important for you to cool off. What is it? Is it the knife in the hand? Is that the thing that's bothering you? <laughs> you don't know. Now, you determine whether it's an interpretation versus whether it's a real perception in a lot of ways. 
Number one is you go back to sensory based terms. If I were there, what would I see, hear, be able to touch, taste? What could I see or hear through my senses? What could I perceive? Now, a good way of determining whether it's interpretation is to ask the following questions. How else could this behavior be described? She walked off angrily. I've never seen an angry walk. Show me one. You know, come on. Look at that anger voice. She's got real good anger in the heels. She's got anger in the knees. Not a lot of anger. A little bit of disappointment in the thighs. The butt looks like it's just plain neutral. I'd say the shoulder is probably happy. There isn't an angry walk. What they did is they walked off briskly and maybe stomped their feet six or eight times. An interpretation can be determined by how else could this be described or what other meaning could someone else give this or how else could I interpret this? That doesn't mean your interpretation is wrong. Do you understand that? All I'm doing is testing it. You may test it and find out it's correct. Are you willing to be correct? Are you willing to be mistaken? Because that's all you're doing. Testing doesn't mean you fail. You can pass the test too, right? How else could this be described? What other meaning could someone give to this? For example, I love turning meanings around to ask people, to make people think about it for a second. My boss never talks to me. Whew. I'm impressed. Your boss trusts your judgment so much, he doesn't always have to be looking over your shoulder. That's really something. And people go, God, you're right, he does. They had misinterpreted it. And in one case, the guy said, nope. He doesn't like me. He doesn't want to look over my shoulder. He tried to fire me twice, but the owner and me are friends. All right, well, okay, that was a data point. He tested his perception and found out it was correct. Now, for example, my wife turned away from me when I tried to hug her. That's a description. Maybe she did turn away from me. My wife doesn't love me. Well, how do you know? She turns away from me when I try to hug her. Turns away from me is a sensory description, okay? Interpretation is she doesn't love you. One with children all the time. My child never listens to me. How do you know your child never listens to you? Well, he always looks down, and then I reality test. Have you ever looked away from a stereo set and closed your eyes to really listen to the music? Yeah, were you paying real close attention to your favorite music? Yeah, I was. Do you think your child might do the same thing because what you say is really important to them? Well, I hadn't considered that. What would happen if you asked them about it? And I've had parents call me long distance, from Philly as a matter of fact, where I picked this up, call me long distance and thank me for helping with their relationship for their kid. And that made me feel really good because it, I do it obviously, because it's normal to me. I, I ask these questions all the time, my nieces, my nephews. My friends think that I'm extra nosy, and I am. It's very important to pry. I think you're prying, and I'm really sorry. I didn't mean to pry. What I, what I really meant to ask was, and then I'll try it again <laughs> in another way. I, I just wanted to ask in a very concerned way. That's different than prying, right? No, it's not. This is my interpretation. Now, how else could this be described? How else could this be interpreted? And turn it around. What's the best possible interpretation that someone could place on that behavior? My child will not take instructions from me. I love that. I heard that from a guy. My daughter will not do as she is told. And I turned to him and I looked at him and I said, isn't it nice to know that your daughter has enough assertiveness to stand up to men who in the future might have bad intentions? <laughs> Totally opened his eyes. For the first time in his life, he saw his daughter as a hero instead of as a bitch. That's an important behavior, isn't it? And he never looked at it, never considered that possible. My wife won't take my advice anymore. Isn't it wonderful that your wife has developed enough inner resources to trust her own judgment? Isn't it amazing to know that out of her judgment, she selected you to love? care for it. Isn't that a possible interpretation? 
And isn't it one they might want to consider and discuss with somebody they love? And couldn't you discuss it with your boss? You ever had your boss say, you never do what I tell you to. And you test it out and you find out what he wants. Or you're never here on time. Isn't it nice to know that in exchange for me being here 10 minutes later than you want me every day, I put in overtime and come in on Saturdays. That's a real high level of commitment for you, isn't it, sir? Yeah, thank you very much. No, thank you for being late. I do that. I mean, where's it written? You have to be exactly on time. Do they pay extra when you show up early? Hey, you're here early. Here's an extra 10. Thank you very much. Do they dock you when you're late? It's a double standard. Try that with your insurance company. You're late. We're going to cancel your policy. I was early last month. Why don't you extend it? <laughs> what? What are you doing? You're, you're meaning testing. You're testing the meaning, the interpretation. We interpret stuff all day. I might interpret, for example, I could look at you right now. I see you're looking slightly away. And I could say, he isn't interested. He's looking slightly away. Robert Vaughn doesn't really care about me as a person. All who who my self-esteem has been. But in fact, maybe Robert was thinking about something. Or maybe he was looking at a light in the back of the camera. Maybe he was looking over at something that caught his attention. I don't know. I just made an interpretation. Was it wrong or was it right? How would I know? I'm going to ask him. What were you doing when you were looking the other way? Could I ask him? Seriously. I was looking at you in here. It would have been my interpretation if I thought he wasn't paying attention now, wouldn't it? So what did I do? I checked it against reality. And guess what happened? I found out he cared enough to really look where it counted through the camera. <laughs> that's reality testing and that's meaning testing. Now the area where we muck up the most as adults is in meaning. So I want to focus your attention on meanings and interpretations. My kids don't pay attention to me. Who can give me another interpretation of that? OK. What's the first mind focus question you'd ask when you say, my kids don't pay attention to me? What's the mind focus? Never, never. OK. How do you know? You can do never, ever, ever. Well, yes, they do sometimes. When they don't pay attention, how do you know they're not paying attention? I mean, attention is not something you can put in your pocket. Can you put it in a wheelbarrow? OK? Let's put it in the sentence frame, an ongoing attention. Does that make sense? Attention is a process. <clears throat> How do you know when they're attending to what you're saying? All right, I just turned it back into a verb. How do you know when they're attending to what you're saying? They look me in the eye is very often what a mom will say, right? Or they get up real close and talk, or they sit on my lap if they're a little kid. Isn't that how you know your kids are paying attention? Big part? Absolutely. Now, suppose you say, my kids don't listen to me. And I find out that what they're doing is they're looking over your shoulder. And then I ask, when are they looking over your shoulder? When MASH is on. You're not going to compete with Henry Blake. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. So you turn it off so you can compete. Now you have their full attention because the reward is you turn it back over when, when they're done paying attention. <laughs> Meaning, we interpret events all the time. For example, does anybody have any friends who are late? OK. Now, tell me what being late means. I want you to just your own interpretation. We'll go down the line. What does being late mean to you? Those people being late, that person you referred to who was late, said you have a friend who's late, what does that mean to you when your friend is late? is always, under all circumstances, <laughs> consistently late. Yes. So it's a matter of conscious choice. We're talking about a lifestyle here. Yes. How late is your friend always? <laughs> you haven't trained your friends right, let me tell you. I'll show you how to break them into habit later if you want. OK, that's a, okay. we'll take that as an always, all right. You know they're late because you look at your watch and it's an hour and a half. What does being late, what does them being late mean to you? I mean, how do you interpret that? What does that? What are they saying by being late all the time to you? I expect her to be late because I've known her for years and she's always been late. So when she tells me she'll come over at 8 o'clock, I'm waiting for around 9 o'clock, 9.30. Mm -hmm. you know, does it mean anything to you? Do you put any interpretation on her always being late? Yes or no? I no? That. Okay. When, you're, when your acquaintance is late, what does it mean to you? 
We're moving one over. Did you have a friend? Did you raise your hand? Is a you have friends who are late? No. No. Did you? Yeah. Okay. What does it mean to you when someone, when that person or those persons are late? Okay. For example. It could mean that they don't. Whatever we find out during the lesson, they don't really value. Or it could mean that uh, something more important was. No. Okay. Who else had someone being late? Raise your hands. Keep going. Okay. What does it mean to you? Okay. All right. They don't like to be early. They don't like to be early. Yes. A bad evaluator of time. They might not measure it well enough. How late? Too late? Are they? They may not understand. To them, being on time may be an hour late. Okay. You know, uh, could be uh, stylishly late. Yes. Or they could possibly forget. They could possibly forget. What else might it mean? They are basically a disorganized person, and they allow themselves a, health, a normal amount of time to prepare themselves for things, but it actually takes them longer because they're really organized. Okay, they're disorganized, and they don't know how to judge their time very well. Yes? Well, there are some cultures where if somebody's there, you talk with them, even if you promise somebody else you'd be there at that time, and therefore the person you're with gets the priority over somebody you promised to meet at the same time. Okay, that can happen. Now, <laughs> so, the point is, being late can mean many different things to many different people. It can be a message from the person to you, or an interpretation by you, can't it? All you know for a fact is they're late. Now, remember on Saturday, some people were 30 minutes late? Okay. If you ask them, I noticed, if you said, I noticed you were 30 minutes late, what would they say? Didn't expect it to start on time. Didn't expect it to start on time, or I thought it started at 9.30. And in fact, there was a little misunderstanding on that. All right? So I didn't take that personally. I did keep their names in my black book just to make sure it wasn't an ongoing trend. Now, the point is being late can mean many different things to many different people. But how many times if our employee is late, we know that that means they don't like the job? How many of us think that when uh, our business associate is late, that means that they don't want our business? We, we do this all the time, all the time, under every certain circumstance. So I get caught up in those overgeneralizations, too. We very often misinterpret. What is a very good way of finding out whether your interpretation of someone being late is accurate or useful? Yeah. I noticed you're late. I notice you're 30 minutes later than you promised to be. How should I interpret that? I asked them that. How should I interpret that? <laughs> oh, they'll, 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 I'll tell you what, they won't do it more than once after I've asked them, how should I interpret that? I don't like being with you. I don't like being with you. they say that to you? <laughs> if I, I, I say, well, then I really think the best thing for me to do is stop fluttering up your life. It's been a slice of heaven, but uh, see ya. You can ask them flat out what it means. If someone's looking away from you, there's nothing wrong with doing what Heimgenach does. Here's a mind focus. I notice you are, and then you stay in sensory reality, I notice you're turning away from me, and you're looking down. Are you really listening to me? Ask them. You know what your kids are saying? Yeah, it's easier for me to listen when I kind of look down. I know people, when they're really head over heels in love with people, they can't look them in the eye. They just cry when they look them in the eye. Has anybody been so in love, you look them in the eye, and it just brings tears to your eyes? I've done that. I've done that. I think it's really, not looking you in the eye is really an act of affection. Now suppose, though, that you were brought up in a culture where you think not looking in the eye means lying. In some South American cultures, for example, a child looking an adult in the eye is a sign of disrespect. All right? I remember a story of a little girl who was brought into the principal's office for some alleged or real offense and wouldn't look at, at the principal, looked down. And the teacher put the kid in, in, in uh, what do they call it, hall, where they, where they have to get punished? Kept the kid after school, detention hall. And the parent called the parents in. 
and the, said, your child is showing disrespect. Notice, your child is showing disrespect. That's interpretation. And says to the, and he looked at his daughter, and his daughter was looking down. And the, the father was paying attention. He said, said, sir, in my culture, where I grew up, it's disrespect for a child to look you in the eye when you're, when you're telling them they did something wrong. Where was that principle, red face? That was the end of that shit. <laughs> What did the teacher do? The teacher, the principal, misinterpreted. And that's very common. It can be done. A, a, kid can, a teacher can yell at you. And I've had teachers yell at me, really yell at me. Not because they disliked me or angry with me, but because they expected me to do better. They were right. Usually I was coasting. I mean, I wasn't cracking a book at school. And they were, they were correct. They got my attention. Sort of got me back on the road for about mm, 10, 15 minutes. Then I slid right back in the gutter. We interpret very often. You can tell when you're getting away from interpretation when you're not describing what you see, what you hear, and what you can touch. She's angry with me is not a description. She yelled at me is. How loud did she yell at you? Did she wake the neighbors? Yup. She was really yelling. How long did she yell at you? An hour. Oh. How often does she yell at you? Every night. We're talking about Virginia Wolf time. Now, how else could this be interpreted? What other meaning could be given to this? Or one of my favorite, what's the best possible interpretation you could place on that? Because so often we look for weaknesses and flaws in our friends and our family. Instead of looking for the best interpretation, give your friends a break. If you're wrong and you think a little better of them than, than you should, what'd you lose? But what if you're wrong and you don't give them the benefit of the doubt? Why should you be a hanging jury with your friends? Of course, when you're dealing with taxing authorities, always think the worst. You never give a status an even break. Now, these are obvious, aren't they? Did you write down the sentences? How else could I interpret this? How else could this be described? What other meaning could be given to this? And then go back to sensory-based questions. What did I really see or hear or be able to touch? In other words, what would anybody, what would everybody who saw this behavior agree occurred? You would agree that the person raised his hand and agree that he came down with a copy of a Fantastic Four number one. Now, this is a killing offense because he damaged the binding. Those of you who are not in the old Marvel comics, let me tell you, those are great old set. Or an original Silver Surfer, that's, that's beyond killing offense. That's slow torture. Now. We deal very often in abstract terms. We use terms like violence, fight, hit, um, screamed, to describe a behavior. And these are very, very vague verbs. We need to make them more precise. So-and-so was violent. Specifically, how did they engage in violence? Well, he yelled at me. He only yelled, he didn't do anything else. What are you doing? You're getting back to sensory reality to find out what really happened. And what's the purpose of that? To enable you to make a little better judgment. Now, I want to give you a few techniques that you need to use. And I'll, I'll give you some that I do. Uh, I do spousal counseling. I do romantic, uh, and I do friendship counseling. I'm always a good counselor for my friends. And then they do therapy on me for nothing. So this is really neat. I, no, I love it when my friends do therapy on me. They go, Michael, you forgot something. What I forget? You forgot to ask, how do you know? And I went, oh, you're right. Well, let's see. This is what I know. Thanks for asking the question. I forgot. We all slip. Okay. Now, for example, she slighted me. How do you know she slighted you? Well, she turned around and did that. That's the meaning of the behavior. You turn to the spouse and say, what did you intend to communicate when you turned sideways? And the person will say, blah, 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 blah. Then I'll turn back to the other person and say, how could she communicate blah, 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 blah in a way that you would understand it? And the person will usually say, well, if she said blah, 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 <laughs> then I would understand it. And I'll say, would you be willing to say that? Go ahead. And she'll go, blah, 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 blah. Now, do you understand how she feels? Yeah. Is that all right? Are you willing to understand that it was a misunderstanding? 
We misunderstand each other very, very often. How many, of, how many of you have ever been involved in a misunderstanding with a boss, a spouse, or a friend? The rest of you are lying, huh? Yeah. The, rest you, the rest of you are saying, no, it's his problem, not mine. There's an old story about a psychiatrist I'm going to lunch with this fellow psychiatrist. They're on the eighth floor. They go to the door. The door opens. In the door is a man. He said, Weissman? And Weissman looks at him. He spits in his face. The patient walks down the hall. Weissman wipes the spit off. Gets in the elevator with his friend and takes it down. Not a word passes between the two psychiatrists. They leave. Next day, lunch, Weissman and his fellow psychiatrist are going to lunch again. It's noon. They go to the elevator, push the button, the doors open, and there is the man. Weissman spits in his face and walks off. Wipes it off, says nothing, stands in the elevator, goes to the bottom. Third day, they're going to lunch again. They go to the door, push the button, the door opens. Weissman, there's Weissman, spits in his face and walks off. They're writing down, and on the ride down, Curiosity gets the better of the second psychiatrist. He turns to him and he says, he says, how long are you going to put up with this? He said, what are you worried about? It's his problem. <laughs> How's that for an interpretation of an event? That's not an interpretation I would give, but that's one you might want to give. Now, Misunderstandings. Have you ever had anybody that misunderstood the meaning of your communication? Of course you have. Now, it's okay to have misunderstandings. It's totally okay. It's going to happen. It's part of normal human life. And it's okay to have them regularly. That's okay too, because I think making up is a lot of fun after a misunderstanding. Right, the making up part is usually more fun than the misunderstanding. The question is, are you willing to clear up misunderstandings with your boss? with your fellow employees. Has anybody ever been berated by a boss in front of other people? You have? You have? I have. You have? What happens if you fight back in front of the other people, usually? It gets louder, and usually it's an issue of, are you challenging my authority? And they're going to find a way to get you if you're fireable. If you've got tenure, it can be tougher, right? 